Thanks everyone for coming. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, integrated tissue specific analysis of biological data. And so I think I'm just going to start with this uh, kind of, this is, if anyone doesn't know, this is a bookshelf of the Human, human Genome Project. And this is like, um, it's the entire reference genome uh, printed out and put into a bookshelf. And I think I'm just starting with this since we're talking about biological data, this kind of marks the, you know, the entry into the modern era of biological data, the completion of the Human Genome Project. And I think this is kind of a good reminder of both the enormity of the undertaking at the time and like how far we've come. So now we have, you know, these machines, um, you know, high throughput sequencing and microarray machines that basically, you know, contribute to like uh, graphs, variations on these types of graphs that we've seen over and over again um, that tracks, this is the, this shows like the growth of just human DNA sequences, but um, this is the case with all other types of biological large data. And basically it shows that biological data is crushing Moore's law, right? And this is great. But I think the problem is this explosive like growth in data acquisition does not necessarily mean or translate directly into, oh, now our knowledge is, you know, growing so much faster. Unlike, you know, CPUs where we can say like, oh, growing, uh, like, you know, at Moore's law means we're, you know, speeding up. And I think, indeed, we see like an example here where a biologist says, we have these giant piles of data and no way to connect them. I'm sitting in front of a pile of data that we've been trying to analyze for the last year and a half. Um, and so, like, obviously we have all this data, but, you know, the question is how can we connect them? So, what do we actually want to connect? And I think while it's super exciting that we have all the data, I think it's important to think that, uh, to realize that the big goal, at least, you know, one of the big goals is to understand us humans. Um, specifically how things work and, you know, why when certain things don't work, uh, we get disease. Um, and I think, I think one of the main things to think about when we think about humans is that, you know, one of the um, things that underpins human complexity is tissue and cell type specificity. And I think uh, these tissues perform different, often very specialized functions in the body um, and are often associated with different diseases. Uh, to characterize and represent the different functions in the tissue, we would like actually to kind of have some kind of a computational, uh, like a tissue and cell type level genome interaction kind of model, a network systems biology model of how genes relate to each other within each tissue. And so, you know, more specifically, it's like, you know, which genes are likely participating in some biological process, such as, you know, the regulation of apoptosis or splicing or like, you know, whatever is going on. And this is very hard, I think, as we probably are all familiar with, like, um, I, I, I think that in this big data era, while biological data is some of the most valuable, it is also one of the most challenging to deal with. I mean, first and foremost, everybody knows probably that it's very, very noisy. Obviously, um, there are very like good labs producing very targeted, high quality, small scale experiments. But once we start talking about the explosion of big data and all this data together, and we throw them on, look at them together, you know, we're going to have to like confront the problem of, you know, just a lot of different noises um, and the, how the noise often overwhelms signal. And this is very much tied together with the fact that the data is ultra heterogeneous. I mean, it's a kind of like trying to be a little hyperbolic, but it's like, yeah, um, you know, we know that the noise often overwhelms signal. Um, like, there's just heterogeneity built into the system. Like, you know, people are creating data from different platforms. They're using different techniques to study data. There are batch effects like that are like, you know, everywhere. Um, and within the same types of data, like, you know, even if we're trying to model the same thing, this is why we often see, you know, like difficulties modeling. Um, but I think we even like to overload the same words, uh, you know, gene identifiers, so that, you know, just to make it extra hard to know precisely what we're all talking about together. Um, and obviously, you know, I mentioned that we're really interested in looking at tissue and cell type to understand human complexity, but most of our data actually isn't necessarily going to be resolved to the tissue and cell types of interest. Obviously, I think now we're generating lots of, I think people are starting to look into like single cell sequencing and then which have, you know, which we can try to get at the cell type question, but um, 
bulk, the bulk of our data is not going to be like, you know, if we're interested in something specific, it's not going to necessarily be resolved. Um, obviously, and then like there's hidden complex structure in the data, it's highly correlated. And what we're modeling has hidden complex structure. So, uh, it's, and so I think I always like to remind people that we talk about biological big data. And, but I think we often forget that our data is like shaped a little bit differently in terms of big than like, you know, a lot of the other like computer science big data, like, you know, explosions that we've been talking about in that, you know, we have much, much fewer samples than the dimensionality that we're looking at versus like, you know, now a lot of people when they talk about the leveraging of big data, it's actually where they have many more samples than dimensions. So I think that's like a fundamental like part of biological data that we need to kind of deal with. Um, so one of the ways we kind of like are interested in looking at this is to how do we aggregate lots of these different types of heterogeneous data in a data integration kind of framework. And like, so I wanted to give a little bit of an intuition for like what we're like doing. So the idea is we start with thousands of genomic data sets. You know, we have like lots of genomic data sets. We have expression measurements, protein-protein interaction measurements, um, you know, transcription factor regulation. And we want to combine it somehow with some tissue-specific knowledge, like a gold standard. And I think the way we think about it is, you know, for most tissues, we, we already have very, very limited gold standards for what genes necessarily are doing in, the, in, in, in like a specific tissue. But what we can do is try to combine what we have. So say we know certain genes are functionally similar with each other, they're acting in the same pathway, and we know that these genes both are expressed in some tissue. We could say like, okay, let's just assume maybe that they're related to each other in that tissue. And can we then like use some kind of a machine learning classifier to kind of predict um, other genes and relationships, uh, tissue relationships when we don't have the data for them? Um, or when they're not annotated in the gold standard. So I think the intuition kind of is just that, you know, now for, uh, for each data set, you know, so TFR is tissue specific functional relationship. Um, we have some kind of, you know, positive examples of this relationship and negative examples. And the likelihood of observing this evidence in each data set, we can kind of learn uh, based on our gold standard and then, you know, calculate like a posterior probability of um, tissue specific functional relationship. Um, so then, you know, we do this for every pair of genes and then we can maybe then, you know, estimate a network. Um, and I think a lot of the problems I talked about earlier in terms of data limitation, we've tried to address using kind of a more semi-supervised framework that we've developed. And so, so right now, so previously, um, we've developed a tissue-specific functional network integration method that takes, so known tissue-naive functional interactions, this is what I was saying, um, you know, the fact that certain genes participate in the same pathway, not necessarily in the same tissue, we don't know, and uh, genes and the fact that, you know, they may, they may be in the same tissue. And then, so part of the making these networks is that I think we've, we've learned that machine learners are very good at learning, you know, differences between the positive and negative you give, but that doesn't necessarily match the biological problem that you want it to solve. And I think um, when we're trying to, you know, get our machine learner to learn uh, tissue specific functional relationships, it's actually much easier for it to just learn functional relationships. But when we want to kind of, add this bit of like, can you learn things that are also in the same tissue, we actually realized that um, it was actually helpful to basically include functionally related genes. So this is like, I think at first it was counterintuitive, but if you think about it now, it probably makes sense to like get a tissue specific kind of signal in the data. You actually kind of put positive, functionally related pairs of genes in other tissues as positives in your tissue of interest to kind of corner out the, um, uh, the, 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 the tissue that you're interested in. And so I think to expand on the fact that our data is limited, we've kind of, you know, made a semi-supervised uh, framework where we take not just known interactions and known tissue expression and we predict, uh, you know, tissue naive functional interactions and, you know, tissue expression and combine that to make a weighted tissue specific functional gold standard that takes into account um, how confident we are that this, uh, this edge might be a tissue-specific functional uh, edge. 
And so I think just to give some details for people that might be interested, I think if you look at this framework before, you, you probably realize that this is like a, you know expansion of a chain rule and implicitly there's a conditional independence hypothesis in there. And I've talked about how big this whole data is and this conditional independence assumption then is def, like probably really violated. So well, the other thing that we've done to kind of take into account this, is, so this is actually, so I'm just expanding out so to have all the little terms like, you know, the prior and the evidence uh, in the formula. Um, and so what we do is actually, um, so I think this might be a little bit of a mess to look at, but I think the takeaway is instead of, you know, the simple conditional probability equation, what we actually do is regularize the probabilities against uh, between each other based on mutual information between the data sets. So this is one of this is the way that we've been taking into account um, the conditional uh, dependencies between data. So um, we calculate so U is a mutual information is the mutual information between data sets for you know just like general signal and um, instead of taking the conditional the evidence uh, the likelihood as is we kind of consider this kind of regularized evidence score. And the other, so WIJ here, um, where I think GT is like the tissue gene set for, um, th th these scores are then the weighted, this is how we inc incorporate the semi-supervised framework. Oh, sorry. Uh, can, can I ask you to do that a little bit slower? For yeah. example, uh, what's D? Like what data are we talking oh, about? Oh, I think it's like every data set, sorry. Yeah, so it's like each date, for each data set, this is like a, you know, each genomic data set in our compendium. Data of the form, uh, interactions between yes. genes, or are we talking about like, any, like F, you know, there's a lot of... It's gene-gene, inter it's some, pair, some information about a pair of genes. So expression correlation, um, PPI. Uh, so like that probability, um, <laughs> the one in the middle of the top row of the box, mm -hmm. that, that specific expression is going to depend on the type of data set in question. Uh, maybe yes. it would be helpful if you go through this with an example, like, you know, yeah. for a given pair of genes and a given, you know, like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, like, you know, if we say for a pair of genes that we think are functionally related, they're like kinase target, um, they are highly correlated. Um, oh, actually, so separately, we, we, for each data set, we've looked at our gold standard, and we know, so this is why if we go back, um, yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, if we go back, we remember there's a distribution of positives and negatives. So we, we can um, kind of think about, like, when we looked at each data set, we learned um, kind of basically what, you know, what you can imagine intuitively is we want this distribution of the positive signal and the negative signal to be different. This means that this data set seems to be informative for, you know. I see. So, so you have positive and negative examples from somewhere. And then yeah. you have, for example, GTEx data. And then mm -hmm. you try to figure out how informative co-expression in GTEx is about, and, and where are your positive and negative examples? Uh, so that was, I think, sorry, it was, wasn't clear. So I think in our tissue-specific functional relationship example, right, we have um, genes that are, you know, both participating in some biological process. And then we have whether they are expressed in the same tissue. And I think we combine these to kind of come up. So this is why I was saying, so our positives are, you know, if you're interested in tissue, whatever, heart. Um, I think you have um, genes that are both in heart expressed and genes that are related in, you know, apoptosis or splicing or something. And where do you get the biological process? Data? So uh, gene ontology annotations. So basically, if they're co-annotated to the same GO term. And um, they're expressed in the same tissue. Exactly. Then you call that a positive. Yes, and the expression is based on like small scale experiments, not like high throughput data experiments. So, so it's like you know, make sure it's like high quality. I see. So some subset of gene ontology. Oh, sorry. Tissue. No, gene ontology. What we do is no. So, because like if you can imagine, if we go up to like biological process, everything's co annotated. Uh, well, not everything. The, the, the genes that have an annotation. So we take like kind of a go slim which we've kind of like is like the cut at which we think it's like, you know, high enough that there's enough gene annotations, but low enough that it's something you can test experimentally. It's something like a small enough uh, biological process. So we actually systematically recruited biologists to curate the gene ontology for us for basically the question that we, we literally asked them, 
you know, for every term, tell us if, if we came to you and said the gene isn't related to that term, can you design a specific experiment mm -hmm. to test it? Mm -hmm. And then we basically, we combined all of the expert data and essentially did a cut that was the highest level at which they still thought they could do an experiment. And basically it makes a functional go slim. So it's a cut through, the, because you can't just cut at a level, then they're mm -hmm. very diverse, so it's uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And oh yeah, and genes are up-propagated. Yeah. Uh, so, child terms of go terms, the parent term inherits the genes in the right. child term. Um, yeah. So, and so then that, we should be thinking of that as our gold standard, and then these data sets, like how many data sets are we talking about, and what kind? So, okay, so there are thousands, so I think the majority of the data is expression data sets. So we basically get publicly available data from GEO. Um, so that's the majority I can, I can talk about. We also have PPI, genetic interaction, uh, shared transcription factor motif. Um, uh, yeah, so that those are like, you know, and it's like, so like anything that can kind of tell us something about the pairwise relationship between two genes. I see, great. So then here, yeah. uh, you've got the probability of your observed for example, expression values for genes I and genes J across all samples in g uh -huh. in your tissue of interest. That would be like D, K, I. So just a little bit, just to make it clear, so what we look at, for example, in like, for example, some, if we look at something like GTEx, when we take a, two pa a pair of genes, it's not like the expression value in the data set. We look at correlation. We, we collapse the, the data set into a G Gene, gene, pairwise, uh, gene well, matrix, I guess. I see. I see. Okay. Then G score. G score. Yeah. 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 So obviously, like, yeah, transformed, standardized. Um, yeah. Then you might just um, go yeah. over this whole time. Yeah. So I think. So I think there are a bunch of things because I think. <laughs> um, so I think let me go over the mutual information regularization first, and then talk about the. Uh, kind of the semi-supervised kind of framework. But I think the confusion is that a lot of it is just literally tell them what little di, the fact that you are going pair by pair, and uh, like literally tell them what, you know, there's a lot of yeah. mathematicians in the audience, I think they just want literally not I situation, see. but like literally what is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think in this case, yeah, sorry. So, because previously I think for the intuition, I think we were talking about, uh, you know, at a high level, not pairwise genes. And then I think to talk about this, I collapse, so G, it's gene I, gene J, um, and, you know, the idea is if in this data set, gene I, gene J has, you know, little di, j score, um, you know, we can, we know the probability of this, uh, you know, if um, for the gold standard, which, uh, if there's a tissue, sorry, specific functional relationship, you know, what's the general probability, you know, uh, if we got a score similar to this one versus, you know, if it's a negative, uh, score, so we can basically look at which probability is higher. Um, but so here, um, over here, we have basically this mutual information regularization where we're saying, oh, what's the mutual information between this data set and every other data set? And if it's a data set that just seems to be very similar to a lot of other data sets, it's going to basically get a weight score that's going to make the probability contribution much lower. And there are some like, so, yeah. You said it's alpha k, so alpha k. It's like a hype, it's like a, it's like a, it's just like a, alpha k and um, eta together, they're like a pseudo count that's like constant in our, uh, oh sorry, not, not alpha k, so eta is a pseudo count, alpha k is, yeah, it's basically like a weighting function. And it's gonna be higher if the? Mutual information is high, like, well it's gonna, okay, alpha, yeah, alpha is gonna be higher if the mutual information is higher, which makes the probability smaller. So the probability of uh, DK, that middle, the probability on the right, that you know the thing that's being yeah. downweighted, that's what she learned. That's what we learned from the gold standard, right? On right. The, in the training. Right. And yeah. now this is basically regularizing that probability down if the data set is very similar to a lot of data sets. Yeah. And then so, so that section, the alpha and the U and the eta, they're part of the mutual information regularization. And then W is how I incorporate um, kind of knowledge, well, how um, I can, this is just the way I, I was writing how to incorporate um, edges where we don't necessarily have, uh, how to expand our gold standard, right? How do I make it a semi-supervised framework is, um, so if 
uh, I is in tissue G, the probability, so we now have, you know, originally we wouldn't have probabilities for these, right? It's just the gold standard would be, you know, one, one, one. If gene I is in the tissue you're interested in, gene J is in the tissue you're interested in, and the I, both of them have a functional relationship. GT is the set the of tissue that, that are specific to each. Yeah, but I think in this case what I'm trying to say is just like it means that tish, your gene is in tissue, yeah, exactly. Like if you are expressed in tissue T. It's a way of expressing positives from the goals. It's not a probability, right? Like it's literally, right. it's not in a supervised framework. Yeah. It would literally be if both genes are expressed in, yeah. let's say, the brain and there's no functional relationship, that's the only way that you can become a true positive. Yeah. And now I think it's just because um, we basically make predictions for each of these stages, we can actually greatly expand, like, uh, kind of. Um, Sorry, yeah, question, other question? So you mentioned earlier that you have uh, uh, mostly uh, co-expression data sets. So how does the, the amount of co-expression versus other could like uh, bias your mutual information and give more priority to, uh, let's say, highly co-expressed data, but actually from BPI we know that the interaction is not possible. Yeah, so I think, I'm, let me double check if I'm answering, oh, let me know if I'm not answering the right question. But I think in our case, so we have the co-expression data um, for each function, for each different uh, like situation, I guess. You can imagine like um, the, okay, sorry, go back. So I think PPI typically is, is obviously very informative. Um, and I think co-expression data, but co-expression data is actually where we get our tissue specificity. Um, I think when we have a lot of tissue, a lot of, lot of co-expression data, I think there's still like, you know, I think if the way we're regularizing it, it, if they're similar, it doesn't mean that they're all going to zero. I think it's just trying to balance the... Um, yeah, the, but I mean the proportion of, of, of knowledge, of information that you get from uh, expression data versus the rest mm -hmm. is unbalanced. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering whether you parameterized uh, the, where the data come from. Ah, uh, so the regularization is happening just on, I think, the co-expression data only. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's, that's like, like a small... Everything thing. else is automatically weighted, right? Yeah. So we don't have, we don't do anything yeah. So we're not comparing. We're not comparing the PPI data, it's mutual information to expression data. Okay. Expression data is being compared with each other, because that's where the bulk of the data is. Uh, I have two questions. The yeah. First is, uh, and I interpret it is as a way to <coughs> using a Bayesian framework to integrate different distance metrics between genes from different data sets. Um, I, uh, yeah, in terms of correlations, so yeah, maybe correlations in as much as correlations and distances are, are yeah, so I think there's, there's sort of like, it's not directly, I think what we're doing, but there is like a, there is like a link, I think, uh, um, but the way it gets, yeah, so I guess, the distant, the like similar, yeah, the similarity between uh, these genes in each different data set is kind of contributing ultimately yeah, to, so yeah. So it is like a, it, yeah, you could sort of interpret it that way. My second question is just what do you mean by this tissue specificity, for example, in the context of comparing correlation between two genes? Ah. Uh, how do you actually like, emphasize there the tissue specific? Yeah, so I think the idea is that, you know, gene expression data gives us some, you know, expression is kind of where we get the potential tissue signal, but the way we're driving this, the learning process is through the gold standard where we, you know, um, so we could imagine like certain expression data sets being very informative for certain tissues. Um, so the other detail is that we actually learn on the entire exp expression companion for each tissue. We don't do any like kind of data mining thing to like, um, limit uh, our co co expression data sets to the tissue that we're interested in. And the kind of motivating intuition behind this is that you could imagine that certain expression data sets, even though they're, you know, 
in not exactly the tissue you're interested in studying, they could be representing biological processes that are conserved between the tissues. And the idea is that our tissue-specific gold standard will be kind of upweighting the relevant expression data sets. Uh, so primarily probably tissue, uh, data sets that are you know, of interest for the tissue, but it can also learn from other data sets. And this makes it more powerful because we can, precisely because we can then learn um, these relationships for tissues that have much more limited data uh, in our expression compendium. Yeah. Is that the matrix determinant uh, bar, the super K bar? I think it's, um, that one is actually, it's the number, sorry, it's actually the number of discretate, so uh, it's the number of bins. So <laughs> this is getting into more detail. So the way we actually learn this framework is actually the data set, we actually discretize it. So for expression data sets, we discretize it into like a certain number of bins. We've tried like, I think right now it's like seven bins or so, but I think that's, we've tried like more bins and it's like a similar performance. And so that's just kind of like a norm, you can just think of it as like a normalization constant basically. Uh, because in some null case, like the probability that little d would equal big d would uh, be if it were sample of uniform with bins. Yes. So that's the intuition. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's basically the intuition. You would have a, if you don't know any, if your data set is not very useful, it's just like a, yeah. And obviously you could do this continuously and look at that part of it before. Yeah, so we, we actually, it's actually interesting because I think one of the first things people say when we like, oh, we're doing a discrete kind of Bayesian framework, people are like, well, why don't you do a continuous framework? And when we've tried to make this continuous, actually, I realized that we realized that it doesn't actually necessarily perform as well. And I think kind of thinking about it more, it's like somehow having the discrete kind of framework and comparing, it actually makes the learning model more flexible. And I think nowadays, I think, with a lot of the new learning uh, stuff coming out, people have kind of like grown to a sort of appreciating uh, discrete kind of, you know, discrete and nonlinear ways of modeling data because um, you could imagine that, you know, somehow this data has like shapes that aren't, you know, necessarily directly modeled by a continuous. Although, like, when we think about it, it's easy to think about it as a continuous distribution. Yeah. Well, I thought the super case of IJ is uh, some sort of correlation. Ah, so I it's... I mean, they're not uniform distributed under no. Oh, so, so D, this is why it's okay. So it's binned, and then, so what, what we can do is, next time we calculate a DIJ, right, we can see which bin it falls under, right? Uh, so we, we bin, like, each, you know, for each expression, cor uh, expression correlation data set, we standardize, we normalize, and then we, 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 we bin the scores. So next time we calculate, you know, next time, you know, your, your gene pair comes in, we can calculate the correlation between these two genes. Basically, it becomes almost like a lookup, right? We can see, oh, it falls into this bin. So we know that the probability of tissues, uh, that, you know, when we know there's a tissue specific functional relationship, typically the probability, the posterior probability is this number. Okay, so um, I think so. I think I've been talking a lot about humans, and I think one of the uh, things that we were considering is that you know. But in order to really understand disease, we want to have a system of experimental verification and screening that's very intractable in humans. So I think this is where model organisms I think are very useful, and I think we've um, kind of tried to develop this framework, um, Disease Quest, where. We're trying to identify human disease genes basically through the fusion of quantitative genomics and model organism biology. So I think traditionally, I think a lot of people have, you know, we've obviously discovered many things in model organisms and tried to like make it make sense of it in human biology. And we've also like obviously discovered things, you know, in GWAS, et cetera, and then tried to go back to the mo model organism to test it. And the idea is can we actually integrate these two things together into the same process to kind of, you know, make it so that when we're like testing things in monogrism, we're increasing the power so that it's something that's probably more relevant that, you know, both to the human biology and to the model organism that we're looking at. So the way we're kind of going about this is um, we have a model organism tissue specific network and we have, you know, some human quantitative genetics measurements. And the idea is, oh, can we just like use the model organism network actually along with the human disease, like, you know, quantitative genetics disease genes, and learn potential disease gene candidates. 
Um, and then the idea is, okay, we, we will obviously evaluate these computationally and then screen these genes in the model organism that we're looking at. Um, and then we obviously then try to relate it back to human disease. And I think our hypothesis is that this is kind of going to be, this is like a, going to be a more powerful uh, kind of approach to finding disease candidates than just taking like, for example, all the reported human quantitative genetics disease genes and just then trying to test them in the model organism. So I think to start with, so we have um, these tissue specific networks. Uh, so right now we tried to apply as a proof of principle disease quest to C. elegans. And we made, you know, 203 tissue and cell types in C. elegans. I think they're colored right now by their tissue system. And you see like all these like single, like AV, AL, um, you know, uh, networks, and these are actually neuron cell types, because in, in, in C. elegans, this is how they named them. <laughs> um, and we have a web interface um, where we've made these networks available for people to query and, like, you know, look at, you know, what, what genes are related to each other in, like, different, these different tissue networks. Um, and I think, so, we tried to evaluate this computationally first, and I think um, in doing a lot of our network studies, we've kind of realized that, you know, in a typical, you know, machine learning framework, we would think that, like, if we're predicting edges, it makes sense to, you know, hold out a set of edges and then predict on them again. But I think in doing a lot of our tissue network stuff, we actually found that this is, like, an incredibly easy problem if you do it this way, just because, uh, you know, you're going to perform very well because even if you hold out, like, a third of the edges by because the, the correlate, the space underlying the whole system is so correlated and the, each gene informs each other so much, if you see, um, you know, two-thirds of the edges for a single gene, you can basically impute the other ones regardless of how well, like, your machine learning problem can be very easy. So the way we typically choose to do the evaluations is to hold out the entire set of genes. And I, we think that this is, like, a much more rigorous way of evaluating our networks because you literally, like, you know, say like we don't know anything about these genes, we hold them out from all stages of learning, we don't ever know what they're annotated to and what tissues they're expressed in. And then, you know, we then try to predict uh, like, you know, their entire edge spaces. Um, and I think what I'm showing here is basically a global network is one that's not tissue specific. And the idea is that I think as we can imagine, the tissue specific networks are better at predicting tissue function than global networks. Um, and I think this is to show that the semi-supervised framework is actually valuable. We also compare with a fully supervised uh, framework where we don't predict tissue expression and functional relationships and we show that um, we also, like predicting those additional edges also contributes a lot to tissue, uh, to, uh, to performance. Uh. So, okay, so now we have some tissue networks. We already have, you know, GWAS reported genes. Um, what we tend to do is transfer the human genes, the GWAS genes, into worm. So I think the way we actually do this is from, it's like a previously published work from our lab um, called Functional Knowledge Transfer. And the idea is we, we will obviously, we transfer an ortholog to, an, to their, the corresponding ortho, the human, or, to the corresponding, in this case, worm ortholog. Um, but what we do is we consider the functional neighborhoods of, uh, so, but these functional networks are global. They're not related at, to the tissue networks that I've generated. It's just like, a local network alignment, basically, between the two genes to consider, you know, is the, like, if the local network is more similar, we'd assume that they've retained more similar function. Um, and we basically transfer genes this way and we just do a simple hypergeometric test to uh, calculate, you know, significance of neighborhood overlap. So you're using network data from worm and network data from human and yeah. then seeing how much the networks yeah. that you build uh, correspond. No, my network, my networks, yeah, so using basically, um, my networks aren't actually involved in that stuff. This is like previously generated from like other functional networks that people have made in the lab. Um, and the idea is just to, in a, not just to find genes that are direct orthologs, but find genes that are likely functional, like functionally similar orthologs between uh, human and worm in this case. So you have, you have a network from some other source for worm, and yeah. from some other source for human. Yeah. yeah, well, it's just like, yeah, Funct like non-tissue specific global functional networks that were generated uh, before, uh, yeah. On yeah, uh, one on the human, yeah, one in human, one in worm, and then, yeah, and then for each gene, we compare their neighborhoods uh, and see how similar they are. 
also have orthologs on the neighbors. Yeah, so that's why we consider the gene families, uh, the, ortho, the ortholog gene families, yes. Yeah, so it's a limited set because you can't compare the entire neighborhood against the entire neighborhood. It's the ones that match up. And then, so in this case, we use an SVM and we make predictions for 25 diseases. Um, they're colored by their disease category. So we have like nervous system diseases, cancer, uh, metabolic, and like muscular. Sorry, and, and what's, what's the, uh, what are you predicting with the SVM? Ah, disease genes. So we take reported GWAS genes for each of these diseases, transfer them into a worm, Use the tissue, use the court, like a, the relevant tissue network to then predict other, so we use the network as features, and we predict genes that look like they have similar network features, and the idea is that these then might be likely possibly good disease candidates uh, for follow-up. Uh, yeah, well, screening in worm for human disease, yes. <laughs> How do you assign the SNPs and the GWAS to genes? Uh, so I think to avoid here. dealing with that problem, we take GWAS catalog reported genes. Huh? Can you repeat the question just so everyone can hear? Oh, oh his, uh, the question was uh, how do I assign SNPs to genes? So what I do for this uh, is take GWAS catalog reported genes. So it's like, you know, in GWAS catalog for each, uh, for, for the different GWAS, the authors will report genes that they think have been implicated, the main genes. So then it's, so then I don't deal with the, that problem. <laughs> um, so I think basically, um, I actually show that our tissue networks actually perform very well in predicting disease genes based on this human GWAS data. And I don't know if you noticed earlier, but actually one of the diseases that I had in my list was longevity. And so it's interesting because I don't think people usually think of longevity as a disease, but um, we, our aging collaborators certainly kind of think that people should consider it as such, and um, well, they reverse longevity, but like, yeah. And then, um, so we take longevity GWAS, uh, and in the intestine network in worm, which I think uh, the worm community has kind of converged on saying that this is one of the primary tissue types that affects uh, longevity regulation. In, uh, and so basically, I think uh, we see that the intestine network ranks longevity uh, genes really well. Um, um, so the key point here is actually, you know, for all our other diseases, we don't have a gold standard. We don't know what the disease genes are. But specifically for longevity, worm actually has been like a big aging model for a very long time. And they've systematically done RNAi experiments to basically perturb genes and see if it affects longevity. So taking our human longevity genes, we're, we basically were like, can we actually recapitulate any of this, like all this longevity research that people have, have done? And that's the evaluation in this, uh, in this plot. So we're evaluating on worm known aging, uh, aging related genes that have been kind of discovered using their specific screens and uh, you know, small scale experiments um, and we actually find a lot of signal using human GWAS longevity genes as input. The next thing that I think people always ask is, well, which tissue network do you know goes with this? Obviously, in, in this case, like, you know, the worm collaborator said intestine is the right network to use, and I use intestine. But typically, it's like, you know, it's maybe, especially for human diseases, what worm network should you use? And I think, so I went ahead and basically took all 203 tissue networks and uh, took their longevity predictions and did the same enrichment analysis on every single one of them. And so here's the top 30. And what's actually really exciting is that um, our, so elementary system is the parent system of intestine. In case anyone, but so intestine, the same uh, tissue that the worm community kind of has converged on as being like the tissue, the main tissue for uh, longevity research actually performs the best in, you know, identifying aging genes. And the, the tissues that come after, apparently, according to them, are also uh, tissue types that are kind of known to be playing a role in longevity. And what's also interesting is that a lot of those long aging screens actually weren't tissue specific. And now we're look actually looking into the predictions by the, these different tissues, because even though they all show enrichment, we actually find 
that, for example, the genes that are being upranked by intestine are actually different, for example, than the genes being upranked by the neuron network. And I think um, our clubbers are very excited to kind of examine what this kind of means for like being able to kind of hone in on like what the tissue specific regulatory pathways in longevity might be. Um, oh, so now changing gears, we, you know, longevity is very interesting, but then we were like, can we actually then like, you know, apply this method to a disease like Parkinson's disease? Um, where, you know, we have a lot of tools to study neurons and worm and it makes sense like maybe we should try. Um, so we made predictions using the dopaminergic neuron uh, network in worm and we basically took some top, we wanted to interpret some of the top predictions we made since we don't have the same kind of gold standard we have in longevity. And we found that the top like um, gene predictions actually kind of clustered into these four modules and then when we did go enrichment on them, uh, as well as phenotype enrichment, we actually found that there were some interesting uh, clusters that came out where we have like a cluster focused on like muscle system, locomotion, and we have like, you know, some synapse signal, some aging signal, and metabolism. And I think these, at least, you know, at surface level, all seem potentially relevant for Parkinson's disease and age-related movement disorder. So um, what are you clustering based on here? So, so I'm, I'm clustering the network, so I'm basically taking the sub-network based on the top gene predictions and clustering them in the network. So the idea is that the, the neuron network. Yes, exactly. Um, and then, so we thought this looked promising, and then our worm collaborators, so Rachel, uh, Rachel Koletsky and Colleen Murphy's lab, was like, you know, why don't I go ahead and try to do a screen then? Um, and basically what she did is try to test candidates for age-related movement disorder, and so what she did is she took day two, day five, and day eight. So these are all adult worms. Um, you know, day eight is apparently very old. And um, we, they would, RNAi uh, knock, knock down these 45 of the top candidates and look for thrashing defects. So you might wonder what's thrashing. And thrashing basically is suspending the worm in liquid. And the worm can swim, but it's apparently very tiring for them. So this is like what worms, apparently, like, young worms look like when they're swimming and we find that, you know, this, you know, thrashing naturally just declines with age. Um, and so if we look at like, you know, now old worms thrashing, we actually see that, you know, for some of our, for our knockdown, some of them swim fine, but a lot of them get stuck in this like spasmy, like, you know, they get stuck in this like weird shape and then like when they curl up and then they like can't come out of it. Um, and so we actually did a lot of, uh, we took basically 1,800 or so of these kinds of videos and got measurements for 13,000 worms um, across these different uh, gene knockdowns. And basically, I think the gene I just showed you earlier now was this top, top gene that showed defects for this stretch um, kind of phenotype. And what we found was that actually many, many of the genes that we uh, basically prioritize actually have significant thrashing defects. And um, so we have some positive controls. These are the like three red genes here, shown here that were, um, that, that were reported in the GWAS catalog. What's actually kind of exciting was that, you know, after we all did all the experiments, this uh, 23andMe Parkinson's disease uh, GWAS uh, report came out. And one of their reported genes was actually, happened to be both one of the prioritized genes in our list and one of the ones that we screened and it actually had a significant thrashing defect as well. Um, so I think we actually wanted to say that, you know, for example, this thrashing defect that we find is actually separate from just general activity, where I think generally for this gene, like activity just goes down, but there's, a, there's like a strong signal for this particular defect. And so our collaborators followed up on this gene and found that actually this BCAT1 knockdown actually will exacerbate the effect of alpha-synuclein on dopaminergic neurons. So Alpha synuclein, when you play, put it, you know, when you overdose the worm on it, like it, so GFP, this is, these are neurons, the dopaminergic neurons that are fluorescing. Um, what we basically see is when we do a BCAT1 knockdown, they get these wavy neurite, um, ectopic neurons, like the neurons actually have some physical morpho morphological damage. Um, which seems interesting, but then obviously we wanted to connect this back to human, and we actually found that, you know, if we look at the human BCAT1, um, 
it actually is expressed in regions that are that tended to generate in Parkinson's disease. And furthermore, uh, if we look at like at the substantia nigra of sporadic PD patients, it is actually one of the genes that seems differentially expressed. Um, kind of the thing to note here is that even though it's differentially expressed, this is like you know one of many many genes, and I think the idea is that it's likely related to Parkinson's disease. But I think if we didn't you know do this kind of a experimental framework, you would have to test probably a thousand genes before you got to this gene as like you know like a particular target. Um, sorry, I think is my time up. I, uh, Okay, um, so I was gonna talk about our other NetWAS framework, um, but this is using human networks to prioritize GWAS genes, uh, but maybe we're out. Yeah, you can talk about it. Uh, okay, so let me skip forward. Anyways, so, and then I was gonna show you our uh, human base uh, kind of, uh, we consolidated a lot of our human networks into this, uh, web server that people can interact with both the uh, networks and our tissue predictions and NetWAS. So you can easily run like the thing that I didn't get a chance to talk about. And then, um, so I think these are some of the websites. So I didn't talk about this. So I provide, so as part of the semi-supervised framework, I made tissue predictions, right? And it turns out that a lot of people are actually interested in those in their own right. So there's a web server to kind of explore the tissue predictions for the you know different worm tissues, and then WISP is the worm networks and human bases like human networks and human networks. So 